problem is that at scale, when you have thousands of people working on UI and CSS, some people will break the rules. They will write complex selectors, they will write descendant selectors and global styles and things like that. We would have these problems of specificity wars between styles where you couldn't fix it because the styles would resolve differently depending on how the user navigated on Facebook. That's what we were trying to solve. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're excited to have Naman Goel on uh, the podcast with us today. Uh, so Naman is a engineer at Meta, uh, and he's currently working on Stylex. Uh, and before we dive into that, Naman, thanks for coming on. Would you mind telling our listeners a little bit more about yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Naman. I work at Meta. I've been working... I met for seven years. I started working on Stylex about five years ago uh, while we started working on a whole new like rewrite of facebook.com, which if anybody uses the web still, you've probably seen it. Like we changed the whole look and everything. I'm originally from India. I worked in Spain for a year. That might be an interesting thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. It's cool to talk about this. Uh, so Stylex does have a long history. How do you feel like it's changed, you know, since when the project was started to like where we are today? Sure. Um, so Stylex was created for the Facebook.com rewrite originally. Uh, this was around five years ago. And actually the first person who worked on it was Sebastian uh, McKenzie, the, the author of Babel. I think he spent like a week on it. He whipped something together. Uh, and it was very bare bones. The first version didn't even have a compiler. The very first version was like an actual runtime implementation. And like, I think they maybe spent three days or something. This was before I joined the team. So I'm not completely sure on the timeline, but they very quickly realized that it was not going to fly. It was just too slow for Facebook scale, definitely. And so they implemented a compiler and it was like just the most bare minimum compiler you could have. And then Sebastian was about to leave the company at that point, like uh, Rome, Rome Tools, which now doesn't exist anymore, but he was about to leave and start that company. And I joined the team. Uh, this was the design system team, as you would call it. We called it the components team. Um, we built all of the components from the ground up. And so the way I started working on it wasn't as, oh, I'm owning this piece of infrastructure. It was more like, I'm on a team that builds components and we need style. Like, like th this is what we're building with. And we, I just started hacking on it to like, just fit my needs. Uh, we needed features to like build components. And so from, from day one, like Stylex has always evolved, uh, informed by our needs as like component, like people building components and also what the product teams who were using our components wanted from it. So. That's how it's it's like uh, evolved. And to some extent, like there was a small period of time um, last year when I was about to open source, when I was focusing entirely on Stylex and I was like moved, uh, like I moved teams and then I moved back to the components team actually, because very soon I realized that it helps. Like not, not having that like direct uh, interaction with product teams and building components like takes away some amount of knowledge of like what would be the best design decision. You tend to start making these like theoretical decisions that may not work in like real life. And so within a couple of months, I was like, no, I need to like spend at least some time building with it, not just working on Stylex 100%. So did you, when you guys were initially exploring solutions, did did you like try CSS modules or any other things? Like what what does Stylex do that like, necessitated the extra library. Right. So let's start with where we were. So we were using something that pretty much resembles CSS modules. Um, this is, it's a very custom thing that you've had internally and it's basically just namespaces for class names. So you put a slash inside of class names and the parser ignores it. That's basically how the in infra works. But all of the same uh, ramifications of CSS modules are what come into play. And what we ran into was some for historical reasons and some because of how CSS modules work. We have like 
thousands and thousands and thousands of components that load on like facebook.com's homepage. And I don't want to give you an exact number, but it was somewhere between 15 and 45 megabytes of CSS being loaded for the average user on one page alone. Uh, and that was because, and that was not because uh, we were just loading everything up front. This was doing the correct thing of, oh, this component loaded, so we load the CSS for this component. It was doing the right thing as far as CSS modules are concerned. But that was not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem was actually that uh, this is probably more a little bit of a historical reason uh, in, in today's CSS with like CSS layers and stuff, things could be slightly better. But really the problem is that at scale, when you have thousands of people working on UI and CSS, some people will break the rules. They will write complex selectors. They will write, you know, descendant selectors and global styles and things like that. And so there was enough of that that we would have these problems of specificity wars between styles where you couldn't fix it because the styles would resolve differently depending on how the user navigated on Facebook. Because whatever you navigate last gets loaded last and then it has the highest specificity. So like that was another big problem. So that's what we were trying to solve. And so the very first version of StyleX, like this was from day one, we knew this was what we needed was it always generated atomic styles, which is atomic class names. Um, and the reason for that was that even though there's like trade-offs, um, there's like lots of recent testing that has been done as well uh, on like, what are the trade-offs? But the trade-offs is basically, if you have a lot of class names per element, there's a small hit that you do take. So when the browser is resolving styles, if you have like 10 class names per element versus just one class name per element, the 10 class names are slightly slower, like you can measure it, but that was nowhere near compared to the, the amount of CSS we were loading. And just to give you a broad strokes, we are, we are in the area of like two, 300 kilobytes now. So we went from like 15, 30, 45 megabytes to two, 300 kilobytes. Um, and that is all of like all of Facebook. So. You can keep navigating and we don't load more for the most part. There's a handful of exceptions of very weird pages, but the majority of Facebook just works off of that one single CSS bundle. And yeah, we stuck with that. We, we've changed a lot of the details of how things have, you know, how things are generated. Um, there's like lots of questions of, Hey, do we generate, um, so like internally we like still split, uh, shorthands, CSS shorthands. So if you write margin zero, you don't actually get margin zero. You get four different class names for top, bottom, start, and end. Uh, because although that's more class names, again, trade off for Facebook. One, it makes it easier to deal with loading multiple CSS files. Because even though open source, like we're like, we want one single CSS file all of the time, there are small exceptions internally. So just having fewer layers of CSS makes it easier but also it generates a smaller CSS file overall. And so we're, we're experimenting with that. That's something we're experimenting with. We realized that, hey, that although that is sw smaller CSS file, it has other trade-offs. So the open source actually gives you all three options, the different ways you can deal with CSS. Uh, and by default, we don't expand shorthands anymore. Uh, there's also lots of other little things like media queries and how we focus active. Lot lots of details I can go in depth with, but. I'll hold off for now. We'd like to thank our sponsor for this week, Clerk. Clerk offers complete user management out of the box so you can build apps quicker and stop worrying about getting authentication into your app. Authentication is one of those things that you think will be easy. You add a few tables to your database and you start tracking users, but then you get hit with an influx of product requests. You might need to add multi-factor authentication. You might need to add SSOs so you can land those cool enterprise contracts. With Clerk, they handle it all for you. You can easily configure all that. You can even have social logins. It's a breeze to set up. And with their free plan that offers up to 10,000 monthly active users, you're not gonna pay for a while. Even if you're hit with a sudden viral phenomenon for your website and a bunch of new people sign up and then never use your app again, you don't pay for them. You only actually pay for real users in your app. Something that's pretty cool. This week, I wanna highlight something that seems like it's pretty unique to Clerk. 
As we've discussed on the show before, funding open source is a hard thing and it's not solved. In most cases, people just work for free and put things out for the good of their heart. But this week, Clerk actually did something super cool. They hired on Colin, the creator of Zod, for three months to work on Zod. They're corporate sponsoring him to make the library better for everybody. I think that's something that's super cool and we should really see more of it. Given that, given that Clerk gives you so much power with so little effort and they're sponsors of the community, really makes me think that this is a company that you should trust. So if you'd like to add authentication to your app without any hassle, head over to clerk.com to get started. And if you want to learn more about Clerk, why they made it, and how we got here, you can head over to episode 75 where we interview the co-founder, Brayden. If you want to find another way to support the podcast, become a member on one of the channels we offer it, or head over to shop.devtools.fm to see what we have on sale. Anything helps keep the podcast. I think one of the hardest things about Atomic Styles, which is just like one style property per class, is that, yeah, when you're specifying classes in an HTML element, the order is like how the styles are specified in the style sheet, not the mm -hmm. order in how they're specified in the HTML. And I think this trips people up with Tailwind sometimes where they think, yeah. oh, uh, I'm sort of specifying these atomic classes and I expect the one that I wrote first to come first, but it's actually, it's the generated order that really matters. And I've gotten into a few issues and like theming situations where this kind of thing can bite you. And I, I think your, your example of margins of like, sometimes you specify, instead of just specifying margin zero, you specify margin top, bottom, left, right, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that way you can like potentially override one of them, depending on, you know, where things come in order. But it's like, it, it gets to be a really like nuanced and tricky uh, situation. So actually, like when people ask me today, like, what is the unique thing about Stylex? It's the merging of styles more than anything else. Uh, because that does like changes. So I wouldn't call them advantages. So um when you when you use stylex, you're writing styles in object and you're writing them outside of the elements in a separate function call. And some people like that and some people don't like that. And uh, Tailwind is similar. Like I think like you have to learn the lingo of Tailwind and then you get to write everything in line. And that's really, really good for prototyping. But like over time, if, if your like list of styles gets really, really large, then those are, it's like, that's where it like falls down a bit. And if you want to extract that out into a variable, like Tailwind doesn't make that super easy to do because of how it works. So there's very interesting like um, technical decisions that Tailwind had to make because it's trying to be a very thin uh, abstraction layer. It's like basically just generating a CSS file. It doesn't touch your source code. And that ends up causing a bunch of constraints on what Tailwind can do. You can't just move styles around ever, anywhere you want. Like you have to put them in a very certain pattern so that the uh, the JIT can detect it. Since we have a compiler, like we're literally transforming your JavaScript files, we have a much more like uh, flexibility on what we can do. So one is like you can apply as many styles as you want, um, and we will figure out that you applied this first, then this first, then this first, and then we will merge all of them at compile time and then only apply what comes last. So you can just follow, like you applied like my base styles and then my override styles, and you don't have to think about your shorthands or media queries or anything. You just be like, this came first, this came last, the last thing wins. Like you don't have to think any further than that. Uh, and that, uh, as and as long as all of that is done in the same file, so the compiler can see the file and figure out everything, it will figure out everything and then the runtime cost is the same as Tailwind at that point, which is nothing. You have a single CSS, uh, like you have a single class name string and there's generated styles. Uh, where it gets more interesting is you can actually do this across files and then you pay a little bit of cost in merging class names at runtime. So we generate some objects of class names, we merge them at, uh, at runtime, but everything is still just as consistent and the cost is super low. It's like no bigger than uh, like this, the class names helper we all used to use back in the day. Uh, and I actually did like a thing against Tailwind Merge. So Tailwind also has something similar to like this, like which is Tailwind Merge. And 
Tailwind Merge is one, both really big because it has to encode every single exception in Tailwind and it has to deal with like shorthands and stuff like that. Um, but also it's like dealing with strings, not, not with objects. And so it's slower to merge them. It has to like parse strings. And because we have a compiler, we can just generate the fastest thing for you. So we can like pre-merge if you wanted to. We don't currently do that, but we like remove unused styles to some extent. Um, all of that. It's a, yeah. So it, with, with the compiler like does add a bunch of like constraints up at the beginning where, oh, you can't use it in a Go. Like if you're writing your server code in Go or Rust, you can't use Tailwind. Uh, like you can't use Stylex there. You can use Tailwind. But if you are writing JavaScript components, then whatever. Now we have a Babel plugin in play. You can do whatever you need. So is the compile, that's what the compiler is doing is it's like looking at the class names and doing all of that merging for you and then creating some static, static output from that. Yeah. So f basically the compiler does as much as it can on a per file basis. So there's by design, there is no cross file compilation. Uh, is that a limitation of Babel basically? Like, is that why you didn't do it? To some extent, yes, but that's not why we didn't do it. The mm -hmm. why we didn't do it is uh, so we can cache every file individually. And that is that is how we keep our build times under control. So uh, basically, we, we transform every single file, and then only the files that change are compiled again. And all we have to do is generate the CSS file again, which is take all of the pre-existing results, dump them in. Um, but when I say like it can do as much as it, as, as it can know is if everything is in the same file, you define the styles, you use them, you can even use them conditionally. So um, I wish I could like show you like those stuff. I, I'm kind of pretty proud of this one is it generates a bunch of bitwise operations to choose one of the various options that you could get based on runtime conditions. So um, the, the, there's a function that merges styles at, at runtime. But if we know the conditions you're depending on and the various results you could get, up to eight results are pre-compiled. So you don't even run the function of merging objects. You just get a bitwise operation that chooses one of eight, up to eight strings. If it's more than eight strings, the code size gets too large. So we fall back to just merging it at runtime. And if you're merging styles across files, so you're passing styles in as props, or you're just like importing them and using them, then everything else is done prehand. You get these objects of class names and the objects are merged at runtime. So the cost is at at its peak, like the worst, the worst case scenario is like merging an object, like object.assign. But uh, actually it's been super well optimized and there's like a tree of weak maps inside of it. So it's like super well cached. So if you merge the same list of styles the second time, it's basically very well. Yeah, we're using React already, so there's a lot of objects being made every render. So, speaking of React, is is Stylex really only for React at this point? I mean, because like Facebook internally had a lot of like hack components, I guess before everything was like transitioned into React. So, is it Stylex mm -hmm. just like solely in the React world, or is it kind of cross the bridge? It's it's for any JavaScript component library. So you can use Stylex with uh, like uh, Vue or Svelte or SolidJS or Quick. We have examples of those. Uh, internally, uh, they do use it in Hack a little bit, but it's not like it's not designed for Hack. And Hack has these uh, interop with JavaScript files, so it it's kind of generating JavaScript files to use it in Hack as well. So that's how it works. But it's, fairly rare, like, because when we wrote Stylex, um, that is exactly when we went from having a bunch of hack rendered, uh, stuff to going all in on react. That was, it was a rewrite of Facebook in react. So for the most part, it's for react, at least internally. So Facebook is meta is a big organization. Mm -hmm. Um, big product, big organization, you get, I'm sure you get new technology initiatives that spin up and spit down. So Stylex having existed for a long time, we, or relatively long time in this space, right? Because the space has changed a lot, um, over the years. 
has there been any internal competition or like internals like, oh, hey, maybe here's a different approach that we could take uh, or any other frameworks that have been vetted, you know, over StyleX's life and sort of how has that played out, I guess? So uh, we didn't get any competition in terms of why don't we use this instead? Like for the, for the most part, people were like, please open source this. And some people actually created their own like implementations of Stylex. Um, yeah, there was no competition in terms of like, nobody was like, we want to use this instead. Um, there was a lot of weird patterns that came up. So Stylex is honestly like, in, in my opinion, it's too uh, flexible on what you can do with it. So depending on your like style of what you want to do, you can use it in different ways. So just to give you like a couple of examples. One is like people who like the Tailwind way of doing things. They like to define a bunch of utilities in a file. So like there's certain uh, parts of Facebook that work like this, where they define like all of the margins that they want to use in their product and all of the paddings they want to use in their product. And they just define them in a single file. And then all over the place, they just import margins dot small. And then they just use that. And so it feels much more like Tailwind if you use it like that, because it's just all of these values exist. You import and use them. Uh, you don't have to rewrite the styles every time. Uh, conversely, there's also people who write uh, the same styles and then use it in like 10 different components. So they need different components for whatever functional reasons, but they should look identical so they can extract that out. So just the way it works, Stylex gives you enough flexibility that people who have like different desires from how they want to architect their code, like it lets them do that. Um, what is like the longest running like thing that people always want, which we still haven't done, is uh, like nested selectors. Uh, so like, oh, if the parent is Harvard, then the child should do this type of stuff. Uh, we have a couple of hacks that I will not elaborate on because more people will start using it. There's a couple of hacks that we've used internally and it's like used in five places and like we kind of don't want anyone to do that because it, uh, we also like spoke to the people at Microsoft. So Microsoft has something very similar, which I didn't know about like till much later called Griffle. And they do like, they have a couple, they made a couple of mistakes in my opinion, sorry, <laughs> where uh, like that and they're like kind of regretting these decisions where uh, early on, they they leaned super hard in uh, in the favor of even more flexibility than what Stylex gives you, and so they have run into two problems. They solved one of them. One of them was compile times. So they let you like import whatever and just use it wherever there wasn't like file level caching that Stylex is designed for. And so they had this problem of like, oh, our build times are too long. And so they like rewrote the entire infrastructure and how they compile. And I don't know how well that has worked, but I know that helped quite a bit. The other one is, even though they also generate atomic styles, their styles got huge. Like they reached a megabyte, I think. And that's because they allow people to just write arbitrary uh, selectors. So there's just people writing all sorts of arbitrary selectors. And then, okay, at, at that point, you can't control the amount of CSS. You're not reusing CSS as much. People start writing you know, custom class names all over the place. And I have a long-standing RFC on the Stylex repo, trying to figure out what's the best way to tackle it. I quite like actually the solution that Tailwind used to have. They still have it, but they added more stuff that I disagree with. But <laughs> they started with uh, uh, group and peer, which yeah. is a very limited amount of what you can do. And then recently, I think they added like, oh, you can just do child selectors and stuff. And I'm like, no, don't do that. That's, I think that's the biggest mistake Tailwind has ever made is adding support for that. Yeah, those, those, those uh, style or class names, those are just so hard to read. Even when I write them myself, I come back to them and I'm like, ah, I, sh I should not have wrote them that way. And it really speaks to one of the other like powers of style X and like, defining your styles like that is like you have an extra layer of naming so it's like my active state isn't this like three screen long thing it's like uh an entity that i can go look at and can expand and become more complex without giving me more mental burden 
this is actually one of the most controversial decisions about Stylex right now is like, people are like, why can't I write my styles as an inline object? And we have a discussion about it. And I, and, and my basic takeaway was, yes, it's a little more annoying up front because you're forced to name everything. But then when you're reading code, you're like, okay, these are base styles. These are focus styles. These are active styles. And you don't need to know what those styles are every time. And so it actually leads to a better, more maintainable code base. And a lot of people disagree with me on this, but like currently whoa, our like escape hatch for that is since it's just a Babel plugin, you can have a Babel plugin before Stylex. And so uh, there's some community members who've literally created like a new function for Stylex uh, in a separate Babel plugin that lets you write styles in line if you want. And, uh, and I have written a separate Babel plugin that lets you write Tailwind. So... Uh, a friend of mine was like, I want to use Tailwind and I want to use Shad CN, but I also want to use StyleX because I want these features from StyleX, but I want this fast prototyping from Tailwind. So you can just compile Tailwind to StyleX and it just works. It's fine. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty clever solution. I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the nicety of like having a, a Babel pipeline is that pretty easy to transform nature of it. Uh, and I guess the, the, the per file, uh, I can also see like the per file compilation, um, helping with build times in particular, because, you know, uh, the, the caching part of that would be pretty hard, especially with a, a code base as big as metas. Like if you're running Babel over the whole thing, every time you would, uh, churn a lot of CPU cycles, <laughs> I imagine. Um, I did have a question about that. So. Is it is it really just like per file and and I think part of the question here is like kind of intrinsic to how meta architects like components per file and things because I think in a lot of like systems that I've seen is you'll have like a components folder somewhere and you'll have like a set of like small components or say it's like a larger uh, product you'll have like a you know, a feature directory, and then you'll have some components for there and then like some layouts and stuff. And some of those files are really small. And then sure, there may be some like reused classes there, but there's not going to be a ton of them. And if you're processing per file, uh, are you just like regenerating the atomic classes uniquely for each file? Or is it still like a combination of like, sort of like a deterministic way is like, oh no, we'll have the same... Um, class names over the whole set of the style sheet. It's it's one hundred percent deterministic. So Stylex works entirely based on hashing. So if you write margin zero, it's going to be hashed into a particular class name, and no matter where you use it, it's the same hash. Gotcha. And uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, the way it works is let's let's start with just styles. Like when we get into variables, things get a little strange that was something it took a while to solve but let's just say we're defining styles styles are defined in style of inside of a stylex.create call we compile it we hash every style we generate class names and that's what is generated uh, as the output of the javascript and then as metadata we generate the css that this file wants to inject into the css file and so the javascript transform is completely cacheable the same input will always have the same output. It will never change. Um, the the meta like the metadata included, like the generated styles included. So all we have to do when we like change, like let's say there's like a thousand files and we change one file. All we have to do is we regenerate that one file, we get the new output from that file, and then we take the old output from all of the other files and we just generate the CSS file, which is just going through these list of class names essentially, deduping them. It's just merging an object and then outputting the CSS file. So that part, even if it's like 100,000 files, which we do have something like that, it doesn't take long. So uh, to give you like what we used to have before we put caching in place, uh, it was not like every build was super slow at in production or whatever, because there was a different level of caching for the whole repo sort of. But Every single time an engineer like opened a dev server to like work, the first time they opened Facebook.com in development, Stylex was taking a minute and a half. 
And so they would be like, okay, let me like open newsfeed and see how long it takes. And everything else is already pretty heavy on Facebook. It's a big thing and it's booting up hack and stuff. And on top of that, there's another one and a half minutes of just transforming every single file. And that was not like feasible. And then I did a basic amount of like uh, optimization just using nodes like workers to like parallelize that. That brought it down to like 30 seconds. And then uh, we did caching and now it's like a couple of, like it's a few seconds. And the the merging of all styles to generate the CSS file was never more than like two seconds ever. So that's fine. That's that's not the bottleneck. The bottleneck was just compiling so many files. Um, and now we don't like we now compile maybe a handful. Where where is that caching happening? Is it like a Babel cache or is it like some like internal Facebook thing? That that's an internal Facebook thing. It's uh, I forget what it's called, but it, it's like a Facebook uh, version of a normal key value uh, store. Like think think Redis, but not Redis. Something else. Uh, it, it's it's a simple cache. It can be done even uh, even in open source. So roll, the rollup plugin, uh, if you run it in watch mode, does caching. So it'll only compile files that have changed. Uh, and rollup also has an, op I think it's a separate thing where you have to turn it on, but you can have a file system cache for rollup where it will write everything to a file system. So if you, if you opt into those things, you get the caching even with rollup. And it, theoretically possible with every bundler, but if you ask me what, what I've been struggling with is making every bundler do good things well. What bundler have you been struggling with the most? Webpack, hands down. Why is that? It's because basically every other bundler has more or less decided that Rollup got the API right. And, and it's very sensible. And I, I remember I wrote the first version of Rollup in a day, and then I added the caching within another day. And Webpack, I've probably spent more than a month on it, and it's still the jankiest plugin. Um, and actually, we actually wrote a whole CLI, like a separate, it uses Watchman and it just watches the whole directory and compiles it, uh, simply because Webpack is such a mess and it wasn't working well in Next.js. And so we have a whole CLI, it should come out in the next release. It's not, it, it's not released yet, but it's merged and some community members are like working on better Webpack plugins. So hopefully we'll solve that. But like right now, that's probably the worst thing about StyleX that I want to get solved. What is the big impetus? What is the big push to getting, you know, Webpack plugins and more community, I guess, bundler support? Uh, I know this is a tension within Meta sometimes of like, you know, focusing on infrastructure that supports product versus like, you know, continuing to push on open source. So what's the sort of like driving factor for that right now? Yeah, I mean, there is some conflict there because there's no direct uh, benefit that we will get from a Webpack plugin or any bundler plugin really. Uh, and so we actually like officially decided not to support every bundler under the sun. So Reasonable. there's no official parcel plugin or official RSpark plugin or anything. Uh, we made like a few and Webpack is just really big because of Next.js, honestly. Um, and Storybook is like the other one. Like a lot of people use Storybook and Storybook uses Webpack. Um, so it's just blocking a lot of people, honestly. Uh, if everybody was on Vite or uh, Rollup already, it wouldn't be as much of a problem. But there's a very large number of people who still need Webpack to work. And uh, if we don't fix it, then like they can't really participate in the community. And so my argument is that for Stylex to be a successful product uh, pro project, we need people to like use it and contribute back. And if you make Webpack work well, then there'll be a bigger community, which eventually helps us. So it's a it's a back and forth with the you know the management, it, whatever, to explain why it actually makes sense for us to put some time into it. But I think it's fine as long as I'm not like sinking all my time into it, which if I tried to do too much, I probably would. I, I personally am a Webpack user, so I'd love if you uh, made it work on Webpack. Uh, Webpack, it's a double-edged sword. It's like the plugin system is like you have access to every part of the car and you can hook into every part of the car, but that also means you need to know how the car works. 
which is a very big challenge. And that's the problem because like we have a Webpack plugin and it's functional, but every single like framework out there, like Storybook uses Webpack in a very strange way. And so if you were doing a vanilla Webpack bundle, it works fine, but it's like, oh, in Next.js, we need all this extra weird stuff because uh, like with the app directory, there's actually not one bundle, there's actually three bundles. And now you need to like shuffle styles from one bundle to the other bundle. And there's like all these piles of hacks that I had to do and they don't work very well, <laughs> obviously. But so, and the caching breaks and things like that. So the biggest problem with Webpack is like, it'll work some of the times, but it'll always break caching. Uh, and actually I'm like very hopeful because there's a community member. He built a, a Webpack plugin outside and they're like, this works way better. It works with Next.js. Uh, it came out last week. I have to like dig into it, test it more. But I'm I'm hopeful that somebody's finally solved this problem for us. Yeah, I think trying to customize Webpack like like you are is a hard task. Like we talked to Zach, the guy behind Module Federation, and just for like the last year, every time he talks about Next.js, it is not in a good light, and it's because of like actually customizing its Webpack configuration is is not simple. Yeah, I, and I spoke to. Tobias, actually, like the creator of Webpack, Webpack. And I have this long, uh, uh, like, issue that I wrote from based on my conversation with him. And he suggested uh, basically inlining the CSS generated from each file because he was like, there's no other clean way. Like, what he suggested was hacky mm. as well because he, he knows that it can, it's too flexible and it can be used in weird ways. Because what we want is actually fairly simple. We just want a Babel step and just take some metadata and put it together. It's not theoretically super complicated, which is why I was shocked that it was so hard to do with Webpack. Uh, and like the other implementations use uh, like virtual files and virtual file imports. And I like resisted that because like I tried that once and that slows everything down a lot because now you have like two X the files that you need to process. And then you have these CSS files where you started with JSON, you generate CSS, you parse the CSS back into JSON, and then you merge it, and then you generate CSS again. And I'm like, it's really wasteful <laughs> to do that. But that's what most people end up doing with Webpack because there's nothing else that works consistently. Yeah, unfortunately. And I, I think sort of more to your point, is just like Next.js in particular has really squeezed like every little bit they can out of Webpack. And to like bend it to their will, they have done some rather unholy things that's kind of hard to decouple. So, you know, just congrats on getting it to work at all, honestly. Um, I, I know like having dug into that for a few issues, it's impressive and intimidating and, you know, hot, it, yeah, there'll be dragons for sure. It's, it's really hacky. Like uh, I'm using some like memory object to store data from one bundle in another and, you know, throwing promises and like, not like, like letting them resolve so that I can wait for the other bundle. It's, it's, it's a big mess. It's not great. And, uh, I've, I've been working with them. Like I've been talking to the next JS team. Um, they added the support for react compiler recently, which is a Babel plugin. And so I'm hopeful that there's like a new pathway to integrate Stylex without opting out of turbo pack and opting out of SWC for everything else. Because that wasn't possible before, and it's now possible in next 15. So I'm digging into that, just, you know, time. Do you see, do you see the team working on uh, integrating with SWC or any of the newer AST tools? Uh, not in the short term, honestly. There's like very little uh, benefit in, mm -hmm. for us to do that. Like we don't use SWC internally. Uh, if there was some tooling that supported flow, like if SWC supported flow syntax, then there would be a reason for us to do it. And uh, currently, no, uh, I have started it. I have a branch where I've written maybe like three of the files in Rust, uh, but like it's, it's a moving target. So I can't, I can't keep working on the Rust implementation when the JavaScript implementation is changing so often. Uh, maybe once it stabilizes, I'll do it in my free time or something. But as like Meta doesn't, care about that as a company like it will give us zero benefit internally so not not yet so you mentioned uh one of the in 
well, I guess not so internal uh, programming languages Facebook has their flow. Um, you've been tweeting about flow a lot and you seem to think it's better than TypeScript. So can you tell me why you think it's better than TypeScript? Okay. Let, let me, uh, let me say it's not like better at everything. It's better at safety and correctness. Uh, it's worse at developer experience. So developer experience falls into, let, let me cover the things that it's bad at first, because that probably makes sense to everyone. Uh, there's two aspects of developer experience where flow kind of sucks. Uh, one is just the tooling. So yeah, SWC and, uh, you know, ES build and bun and Dino, they all support TypeScript syntax natively now. Nothing supports flow natively. And so if you're using flow, you need a Babel plugin and then you need a special syntax plugin for Babel now, if you want to use all of the newest features and so just setting it up has become worse and worse over time. It used to be better than TypeScript once upon a time because it was like supported natively in Babel and TypeScript was not, but that has long not been the case anymore. Like TypeScript is way better if you want to integrate it into a project Like you have to set up way less stuff today. A VS Code plugin for TypeScript, way better. Pretty, like the type errors are, I want to say on par, but at least there's some plugins that make TypeScript slightly better. Just the community of TypeScript's way better. Again, like uh, if you're looking for um, type definition files for TypeScript, there's basically everything and Flow doesn't. That's so community tooling flows worse. We all know that. Um, the other one in like how the type system itself works, uh, TypeScript is very, very in favor of just giving you every feature possible. So TypeScript gives you like template string types. So people have written parsers in types and goes insane. Uh, and, and it also does, it also makes you write less type definitions. So in TypeScript, you can just omit the return types of functions always. So flow makes you write more types in some of those cases, like flow makes you write all types for exports in every single file. So developer experience a little bit worse. Now, why is it actually better at, at, at its core? is because let's start with the original design decision that TypeScript made, which is variance checks. Now this is, gets really nerdy and I don't think a lot of people will understand, but let me ask you a question. Is a cat an animal? Yeah. Okay, yes. If a cat is an animal, is an array of cats an array of animals? Yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> Justin's right there, exactly. So th this, is, this is the core conflict between Flow and TypeScript. TypeScript decided that most people will say yes, like you did, Andrew. And so they just made it so, which is wrong. Okay. And why is it wrong? It's only wrong because JavaScript is, because arrays are mutable. Because if you have an array of animals, you can push on an array of dogs to it. You can push on an, uh, uh, like you can push on a, 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 you know, not a cat to it. But like, if you start calling an array of cats an array of animals, now suddenly you're allowed to push any animal into it, not just cats. And the problem only comes with mutation, not, not reading. And so Flow had this feature first and TypeScript also added it later. There's these read-only types. So you have arrays, but you also have read-only arrays. So uh, a, an array of cats is a read-only array of animals, but it's not a mutable array of animals to be fully correct. And so this behavior is done correctly in Flow where if you try to call it a mutable array of animals, flow will give you a type error right there. And TypeScript will tell you nothing. It will just let you do whatever. So you can have an array of cats, call it an array of animals on the next line, and then push a dog into it and you get no type error. And so if you don't care about that, then TypeScript is probably fine a lot of the times. You know, a, a lot of people think they don't care about that. But this is why you have these edge cases in TypeScript, where things are wrong and you don't know why. Because like it's purposely just letting you be slightly wrong some of the times. And so that's one big reason why flow is better. Uh, there's smaller things like the as casting. Like in TypeScript, you can just cast a string to a specific string, which it's not. And it does no checking. And flow does. Like if you are doing something unsafe in flow, you have to go through the any type first. That's the only way to do it. TypeScript, you can just do it in random other places. And that feels very scary to me. 
That might be a little nerdy and be like, most people will be like, I don't care about that. Let me give you the very specific, why don't we have this in TypeScript so far type of features. Like, and if TypeScript added them, they would probably fix 80% of my complaints. There's two features, exact object types and opaque types. Opaque types is easier to understand. I also care about it less because TypeScript people use this feature called uh, unique symbols in TypeScript and they abuse it and they like create these tags and this messy stuff. And all of that is just a hack around the fact that there's no opaque types in TypeScript. Fine, it's a hack, but at least it works. There's no hack to make exact object types in TypeScript. And that is a feature that should be there. And I don't understand why it's not there. And it's so annoying. And there's like a six year old issue on TypeScript, but people are like, please add it, please add it, please add it. They're like, what's the use case? And people keep giving them use cases and they don't understand. And I can give you the simplest use case. I have a component. It takes a style object. The style object can have color or background color, nothing else. TypeScript will always let you pass in extra stuff for no reason. And so you have to manually do runtime checks and pluck out just those keys. And you made your runtime slower just to get around the fact that TypeScript won't let you say nothing else. And Flow made this change like a few years ago. Like Flow didn't always have this feature either. But it's like a game changer. It's like so useful as a feature. I don't understand why this one feature is not in TypeScript. So that's my biggest reason. Uh, the type system itself is pretty nice. And uh, finally, the big thing this most people don't care about outside of Facebook is, is it's like way faster at scale. And it's faster for two reasons. One, it's written in OCaml, which is a native language, which is also its downfall in many ways because nobody wants to contribute to it. But uh, the other reason is some of those like DevX, you know, losses early on, where you have to write more types out, let's flow do less work because it made you write, write it out. So for performance sake, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you say that though, because uh, so JSR, the new uh, JavaScript registry from the Dino team has this thing called like slow types where they're like, oh, like, you know, doing type inference and stuff is actually really slow if we have to do everything. So we want you to be really explicit, like, you know, type all of your returns, you know, for everything. And we can like generate better type documentation and stuff for that. So it's like, I think, you know, TypeScript really started to be like very flexible and, you know, like the structural typing and everything that it did is like, it's not a very sound type system. I guess it's a lot more, it's getting more and more sound as time goes on, but it's like, was not very sound in the beginning at all. And I thought that like flow is always more like more concerned with soundness. It's like, we actually want to have like more confidence with types. L let me, let me give you one other thing that I heard from the static Hermes team. So have you heard of static Hermes? And yeah. so, uh, I was on a flight with the person Shwetan who like gave a talk about it like if you've seen the talk showing off static Hermes that was him um, and I was like talking to him and although TypeScript is kind of supported they are struggling with the lack of exact object types as well because an exact object type can basically be compiled into a struct uh, in binary code but an inexact object type like an open record in functional language terms like that's an open record that that has to be compiled into some kind of hash map with like dynamic key lookup. So it's going to be slower. And so leave everything else out. Like it will compile to slower code as well. Like if you don't have exact object type and I don't know, like this is, this is one feature where I feel like there's no excuse for Tailwind, uh, for TypeScript not to add it. Uh, it makes sense in every like principle that TypeScript has. It's not a correctness thing. It's not a purity thing. It's just, practical, useful feature for end developers. And this is the one where I don't know why they have such a hard resistance to this feature. I don't know. I'm sure it's some like per performance or internal implementation or some like really deep gnarly gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it's some sort of internal implementation thing because um, people have done some weird hacks where it sort of works. I've done a hack in Stylex, which is I had to write every single key uh, ev like in every single known CSS property. And when you 
say this is the styles I want. I said everything else to never. Nice. <laughs> and so at least you can't pass other un other known styles. You can only pass unknown styles. So that's something. So I know we just talked about flow for a long time, but one more question mm -hmm. on languages before we move on to our final question. Uh, there is something we haven't talked about that you think, I think, is the language we should all be using to write code. What is that language? <laughs> I know what you're referring to. So I think you're referring to Swift, which is, I'm not, I'm not going to say that's the language we should all be using to write code instead of JavaScript. It, I think it's the language we should be using instead of Rust. So, so my take there is not, not all Rust projects, let me be clear. So I think Rust is in this place where it's a very, very fast, low level language, which is great for writing kernels and stuff. And it's nice enough that people have started writing products in it. Like there's like UI libraries and stuff like that written in Rust. And all of this JavaScript tooling is being written in Rust, SWC, et cetera. And I think those things where, like if we don't care about 10% of a performance hit, then Swift is a better language than Rust because it's easier. It's like, it's still not garbage collected. There's no garbage collector, but the ma man manual mem the memory management feels automatic. Like you don't have to, it's not a borrow checker by default. Like you just write styles, uh, you just write things like you do in JavaScript and they work without a garbage collector because it's just doing counting. So the compiler like sees when you like take a value and it puts in some calls and it's fine. It's, it gives you like a five, 10% hit in total performance, but it's fast enough for most things. And it looks like JavaScript, it's easier to pick up. And it has all of the other benefits that Rust has. It compiles to Wasm, it compiles on all platforms. And this is one of my, like another like secret reason I really want Swift to be like a language that's used for JavaScript tooling is uh, it has interrupt with C++. So Rust has interrupt with C. So you can use FFI to like, in you know, use C code in Rust and Rust code in C. But you can't use C++ and actually like almost no language interrupts with C++ because C++ is a mess. And Swift does now very recently. And that that's when I started talking about Swift a lot actually is like when they added support for C++ interrupt because... Uh, Hermes is written in C++. All of the flow tooling is based on the Hermes parser at this point. And so my secret aim here is like, hey, we could create a new tooling based on Swift and that would support flow without writing a new parser. And that's like one of the other reasons. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting to learn that the creator of Rust actually works on the Swift team and like has for like the last half decade. So they're they're almost sister languages. Yes, they they started around the same time. The creator of uh, Rust moved to Swift. Uh, Rust has copied some features from Swift, and Swift is copying features from Rust. Uh, they're actually very similar. I just think they're slightly different levels because when I'm like I as I said like I have written some Rust, I've been trying to slowly write an SWC plugin, probably take a year at this pace more than that. But um, what like really struck me about it is even though it's not necessarily hard all the time, it feels very tedious in the amount of just busy stuff that you have to do in Rust compared to Swift or JavaScript. Like you have to constantly unwrap values and constantly clone them. Like you have to do all of this stuff manually where Rust goes super hard on making every single thing that could cost you even like a drop of performance explicit. Like you must know that you created a copy here. You must know that you incremented a counter here, like every single thing. And Swift is just like automatic in all of those things. It's just like, it will create copies when you need to. Uh, it won't create copies when you don't need to. And so I feel like Rust is too low level for the kinds of things we're doing with it. Like if you're writing a kernel, if you're writing an operating system, yeah, still probably Rust is the better language. Uh, even a browser, like I know that like Firefox uses a bunch of Rust. Like I'm not going to tell them to switch to Swift. That <laughs> makes no sense. Rust is the better language there, but like a JavaScript bundler could probably be Swift and be fine and, you know, be nicer to write plugins for 
especially for JS devs, because Swift looks way more like uh, JavaScript than Rust does. Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting take. Uh, I mean, I'd say broadly, no, 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 I, I wasn't saying that uh, negatively. I mean, I think broadly that I, I do agree, I do agree with your your perspective here, though, that it's like Rust, there is a cost to Rust. Uh, I've written a lot of Rust over the last few years, I write a lot of Rust every day, um, and there is a real cost to it. And especially for like application level things, uh, it can be the right, you know, thing in some cases, you know, like if you're trying to squeeze out a lot of performance, I think like in the case of like building games or something like that, that probably make a lot of sense. Um, and if you decide to do it for other application level things, you do, you are going to pay like that kind of continual cost of like, it's just going to be, you know, 20% harder than it may need to be otherwise. And, and I think there's a lot of languages in this like mid tier uh, that is like one level of like complexity below, or like, I guess one level of like difficulty easier than what Rust is that give you a lot of uh, value. And then, you know, honestly, for a lot of applications, I just feel like there's so much tooling opportunity. You know, of, of course there's Swift, there's like Go, there's, you know, even traditional things like doing things on the JVM, which, you know, kind of shutter, but like, Kotlin is like pretty decent and you know, yeah, there's just like a, there's a lot of good. Kotlin's pretty nice. So, so Kotlin I saw and it looks like Swift, like they yeah. look surprisingly similar. Like they both use funk as to the keyword and stuff. Uh, I, I would say that, uh, Kotlin, Go and Swift are in the same area of overall throughput of performance. What sets Swift mm, apart gotcha. from Kotlin and Go is the garbage collector. So Swift isn't garbage collected. So I think they are suited for different things. So when when you care about throughput and not consistency, like servers, uh, Go and Kotlin is great. Uh, if you're doing like UI where like you don't want a GC pause ever, Swift's better. And then bundlers, you could go either way. It would probably be fine. Um, yeah, and I think... Uh, in terms of how it would feel to use it, it's more rusty than like Go. Yeah. Like Go feels like there's people who love Go and hate Rust and there's people who love Rust and hate Go uh, because like Go doesn't have like a rich type system and doesn't have like um, typed, mm -hmm. en what, what do you call them? Like uh, sum types, essentially. Enums with, enums with data. Um, and Swift has that and Rust has that and Go and Kotlin don't. And so if you get addicted to those kind of like type system features, then like Swift will still give you all the niceness, which, uh, you know, Rust gives you, but it also gives you the downside, which mm. is like, like yeah. Rust, Swift has a very slow compile time, uh, itself and Go is like super fast at compiling. So trade-offs, but that, that's why I said it replaces Rust for this strata of applications. I don't think it replaces Go or Kotlin for what they are used for. Um, like the server infrastructure is like really big on the JVM and also go at this point and Swift on the server while like as a language, it's great. Even for the server, it has like every feature you might ever want for a server app. The ecosystem just isn't there. So maybe in a few years, it'll be a good contender, but right now it's a smaller ecosystem. Uh, hosting is harder, all of that. Yeah. They had a Swift for windows came out, not too terribly long ago. Right. So Swift for Windows has actually been out for a few years, but it used to lag behind the Mac version. So like they shipped, uh, I don't know, like regular expressions, but then it didn't come to Windows till later and stuff. But then um, this company, like the browser company who makes Arc. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they built Arc for Windows with Swift. So they could just take their code from Mac and just bring it to Windows. And when they did that, they hired one of the people who used to work on Swift for Windows and basically funded his work. And now Swift for Windows is basically on par and it's kept up to date. And they also did a bunch of work to uh, take the C++ libraries from Windows um, for UI and like connected it to Swift. So they were like, we don't want GC pauses in our app. Like that's one of the reasons they chose Swift is because C sharp is garbage collected and 
JavaScript is garbage collected. And they're like, all of these UI frameworks on Windows are actually garbage collected. And we want something that's as fast as possible. So they took the lower level C++ stuff and like put it, uh, mapped it with uh, Swift. And that's how they built Arc for Windows. That's really awesome. So I did a test. Like I, I did a test of compiling like a function of Swift with VS Code on Windows and it worked fine. Sweet. I have to try it out. I haven't played with Swift for a long time. I need to, I need to give it another go. Um, cool. So before we wrap up, we always like to ask a future facing question. Um, so you spent uh, a good bit of time now working on Stylex. Uh, what do you think is the future of styling? Both maybe where you want to take Stylex, but like, especially in the category of like CSS and JS, like what is the future in this space? Okay. This is a going to slightly big answer. <laughs> There's like three levels to it. Uh, one is, um, short term. I think everything is going to go like build time. I think runtime CSS and JS was a mistake. Um, so style X is build time. Uh, yeah, like it'll be a long tail. People will slowly move off of it, but runtime CSS and JS is just always going to have problems. Um, but like longer, longer term, I think that CSS itself, like as a language is moving so fast and there's so much cool stuff that's come out in CSS, like I could have a whole episode about that. And I think sooner or later, they will solve Tailwind essentially, where uh, you won't need a tool. Like you'll just be able to write inline CSS and be able to write media queries and pseudo selectors inline on an element and have it work. Like as soon as that comes natively, like we won't need a lot of the tools that we use most of the time. Uh, at that point, I, even something like StyleX would become like much, much smaller where I don't think the need for it would go away entirely simply because like merging of styles needs some like manual checking of things, but it could probably become like a really small, like helper tool to merge styles. So that's where I think styling is going on the web. Uh, in terms of where like my work is going uh, with StyleX as well is uh, React Strict DOM. So React Strict DOM, it's open source. It's still experimental. Uh, I had a talk at React Conf where I talked about React Native and React Strict DOM. And a lot of the design decisions of StyleX were made for that. Like, how do we make something that's like not dependent on a CSS engine in any way from an API point of view? Uh, and so I think on the StyleX side, that we will fill out some of the missing features. We're looking into like, the descendant selector stuff. There's like smaller details of like, when you use lots of media queries, can we like find ways to share them? Can we find ways to unify them? You know, stuff like small cleanup stuff, nothing uh, specific to point out, but then to bring all of those like concepts to React Strict DOM. Right now, a lot of it is just done at runtime uh, on React Strict DOM because again, it's JavaScript, we don't care, you know, we don't have the same constraints as the web on uh, React Native. There's no server-side rendering so far, but uh, it's coming. Like we're getting server components on React Native. There was a talk by uh, Evan Bacon about that. One of the best talks at uh, React Conf, uh, if you want to see one. And w as that comes, as performance is always going to be important, I think over time we will start doing the same like bringing the same concepts to React Native, doing ahead of time compilation for more and more stuff. And yes, on one side, there's like static Hermes and all of that going on, but the same thing applies to the StyleX implementation for React Native. So I, I don't know. I know was, lots of people will be sad, but I think forward looking, there will be more and more compilation, not less. The, we will move some things into the platform and then we find new things to compile instead. So build steps are never going away in my opinion. They're here to stay. Yep, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm I'm stoically not no build. Yeah. So that wraps it up for our questions this week. Thanks for coming on, Naman. This was a really fun look into how Facebook views their CSS and how StyleX works. So thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was great talking to you, and I love the podcast in general. Yeah, thanks, Naman. Uh, this is this is awesome, and I particularly appreciate the conversation about Swift. Uh, definitely more for me to look into there. Uh, yeah. Good, uh, good tip. <laughs> <laughs>